short little video that Christy's going to play for us right now. Good morning, Reagan. Good morning. Good morning, Madison. Good morning, Johanna. Good morning, Good morning. Johnny. People are always asking me why. Why do the same thing every year? Why not move on? And I say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Johnny? Present. I'm comfortable. I know the routine. And I don't want to brag, but I'm pretty popular around here. I do really well in sports. No! No, not my house. Well, I'm just very successful yes. here. Why would I go and mess that up by graduating? B. But don't. I mean, in the first grade, I may not know all the answers. D. D. Dog. E. The hours are longer. I hear they don't even have nap time. I mean, I just don't see the upside. Then first grade leads to second grade, second to third. Then you're in high school reading boring books with no pictures. Three, four, five. But he was still hungry. Next thing you know, people expect you to get a job and give up summer vacation. <laughs> no, sir. I think I found my niche. Thank you very much. Home sweet kindergarten. Besides, I mean, what if I failed first grade? How humiliating would that be? No, nope, just don't think I could handle that kind of embarrassment. And sometimes better why you. That was not a good choice. Very disappointed. <laughs> oh, we laugh, don't we? But the question still remains, is our faith still in kindergarten, right? Is our faith still in kindergarten? Have we decided to move on, to move forward, to grow in what God's given us or not? Now, one of the things I, I preface and give you that uh, video night in, in preparation, we're going to study about a church in the New Testament. These are, about, these are messages of revival we've been talking about in the last several weeks. And I'm going to talk to you about a church tonight who didn't stay in kindergarten. Uh, they were out on the front lines. They were out working in the kingdom of God in a very pagan culture and a very uh, ugly world. It reminds you a little, a lot of where we live uh, in our world right now. God is working through this church, and he wants to work through our church. Now, the, uh, the scripture tonight comes from Acts chapter 11, so if you have your Bible, uh, find that passage, and uh, as you note on the outline, this is, a, uh, this is a, a lesson about the church in Antioch and about what was happening uh, as Peter goes back to Jerusalem and the Jerusalem church, and he tells them everything that we studied about last week, how he had this vision from God, and it was all about uh, allowing the, the Gentiles to hear the message of the gospel, and they were going to come to faith. And the Jerusalem church was trying to take all that in. And then lo and behold, because of all the persecution that had happened uh, since the, uh, the martyrdom and the death of Stephen, what happened is uh, Christians were dispersed everywhere uh, all over the known world. And some of them made their way 300 miles north of Jerusalem to a town called Antioch. And Antioch was a, a place, it was the third largest city uh, in the Roman Empire, had over 500,000 people in it. It was just uh, smaller than Rome and Alexandria, Egypt, and then you had Antioch in Syria. And so the place was an, uh, enormous compared to today's standards. It was like uh, the New York City of uh, that area. And because of it, there were all kinds of Roman influence. There were Roman uh, deities that everybody served and honored. There were pagan uh, rituals galore. Uh, they served uh, one of the one of the main uh, the temple of Daphne was one of the great uh, uh, shrines that was uh, in the town. They called it uh, a city of gold because it had all kinds of beautiful, magnificent buildings in it. It had the only street in the known that known part of the world that their main street was all paved with marble. Uh, 
all the way down the street. And so this city was uh, uh, fabulous and magnificent to look at, but in its depths it was a pagan, uh, ugly society on the inside. And guess what? The Church of Jesus Christ made it there uh, probably quicker than any other place. And the Christians were so bold that went there that they started winning people to Christ, and the church at Antioch began to grow and became, became a greater influence than the church back in Jerusalem. So <clears throat> we're going to read a little bit about it tonight, but it all comes back to the uh, in Antioch was the first place people were called Christians. They weren't called Christians uh, to honor them. They were called Christians to make fun of them. But yet they t- the, the believers in Antioch, in the church in Antioch, took the name and they, uh, they wore it proudly and they evangelized their community. It's amazing. They become the very first church to send out missionaries. Who were the missionaries they sent out? You remember? Paul and Barnabas were the first ones that were sent out from Antioch. And it's, it's an amazing story. And we're going to read some about it tonight. And as you look at it, we're going to look at verses 19 through 26 totally. In uh, verses 25 and 26, you're going to see up on (coughs) the screen behind me. So verses 25 and 26 say, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. Now you remember Saul, his name would change. And his name changes mostly because uh, the name Saul is the Jewish name. Uh, part of the uh, of uh, his name and then when he becomes Paul that becomes more of a Greek uh, style of name and so that's what uh, takes place as his name changes and his direction changes and so we read about that Barnabas who remember took Saul aside from the very beginning and encouraged him and was one of those uh, main uh, leaders in the Jerusalem church it says he departed for Tarsus to seek Saul and when he had found him he brought him to Antioch so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch now what's in a name when we think about that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch do you know it's amazing uh, we'll spend lots and lots of time when we have children trying to come up with the right name, right? And they, you might even uh, get a book like this, the baby names, and they're like a billion baby names in this book, and you uh, read through them all, and you're trying to figure it out. Most of the time, we name our children special names that have to do with our family or have to do with uh, something uh, special that happened in our lives or uh, in in our case, uh, biblical names that had special meanings that we wanted to pass on to our kids. Think about the fact that Christian that we talk about today, but even today, what do we know about the word Christian? It's lost its meaning in many ways, right? Why? Because people who are not Jews and who are not uh, uh, Muslim and who are not some other kind of religion, many times the world just calls them Christian, right? Whether they have any kind of relationship with God through Christ or not, that's what they're, they're called. We know that back in this day, that word Christian was used as a derisive term, uh, a term to make fun of believers. And you can imagine a, a city full of pagan deities and people who worship pagan deities, they'd be, they would be looking to name Christianity as a cult, right? A cult, a sect, a, uh, you know, a splinter group that didn't have any kind of influence at all. But what was happening was that Christians uh, stood up for what they believed and shared the one true God with their world. And the Bible says when we read, uh, start reading at verse 19, if you'll go back a few verses from what we just read <coughs> to verse number 19, it says, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. Now that term Hellenist means 
Greek-speaking Gentile, okay? So if you see that word Hellenist, that's what it means, Greek-speaking Gentile. And they went (coughs) preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand, this is verse 21, is important. The hand of the Lord was uh, was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. When you read all the way through the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament or New Testament, and you read about the hand of the Lord was upon somebody, what does that mean? He was working with them, and his spirit was in them. And what was going to happen because of that? Good things, and people's lives were going to be changed, and it was recognizable. It was something that people could see. So it reminds us the hand of the Lord was uh, with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Then the news of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to go as far as Antioch. So what happened? Well, they heard about it back in Jerusalem, and they had to go check this out, right? And so they sent Barnabas as an ambassador from the church uh, at Jerusalem to find out what was going on. And when he came (coughs) and had seen the grace of God. Now, can you imagine, what does it mean to see the grace of God? You see the power of God. You see the forgiveness of God. You see uh, the the amazing uh, change that comes upon people because of his grace. And that's what Barnabas saw. And he says he was glad and encouraged them all that with purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. For he was a good man. Full, this is talking about Barnabas now. Full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Now, what does all that mean? It means that uh, the people that went to Antioch who were believers, disciples of Christ, were bold enough to preach his word, bold enough to, re- to realize that it wasn't just the Jews who the gospel was for. The gospel was for everybody. These were certainly not people that decided to stay in kindergarten with their faith, right? These were people that stepped out and said, we're going to grow, we're going to share, we're going to use what uh, God has given us. And because they did, we read about how the hand of the Lord was with them. And how a great, because a great number of people don't believe in Christ Jesus as Savior unless God's Spirit's working through that group sharing. You know, because we can't save anybody. I've told you a hundred times, I can't save a single person. No pastor can. No teacher can. It's only the Holy Spirit who draws people unto Christ. And when the Spirit draws people unto Christ, He does it, though, by using us as uh, his ambassadors using us as his uh, instruments to share the love and the gospel of Christ with people. So that's what's taking place right here. These people believed and uh, they stepped out in faith and a number of others believed and turned to the Lord. And then, <laughs> of course, like what happens in every situation, the news gets back to the Jerusalem church. They hear about it. They send Barnabas And, of course, what was Barnabas expecting? You don't know, do you? You're traveling 300 miles from Jerusalem up to Syria to Antioch, and you've heard this news that a great number of of, uh, Gentiles are coming to know the Lord, but you don't know what that means until you go and you see it and you experience it yourself. So Barnabas goes, he experiences it himself, and what does the Bible say about that? He sees the grace of God of God. Now, you know, I long for the day, we're talking about revival in the land, I long for the day that we see the grace of God being dispensed upon all people around us. But that, it it comes when God's people get serious about faith. When we don't stay in spiritual kindergarten, but we get serious about being disciples of the Lord, and we allow God to use us to share our faith and testify about who he is. And then it goes on to say that he was glad. Barnabas, when he saw it, he not only saw the grace of God being demonstrated and worked out uh, within the church and the community, he was glad. He was thankful. He was not one of these people that said, boy, we should have done that. Or, or uh, uh, I wish I'd have been the one who did that. Or what? it was 
He rejoiced when people came to faith. Oftentimes, I want you to think about, for just a moment, a person that you probably dislike the most in life. You got a person like that? Don't look at me now. I'm new. I'm brand new. But I mean, somebody that you may dislike the most in life. Now, what if that person that you dislike the most in life suddenly, amazingly, miraculously got saved in their faith with Christ? And they changed. Would you sit there and soul and be uh, and pout because, well, I don't have anybody to dislike anymore? Or would you rejoice and be glad? I would hope that we as believers wouldn't wouldn't uh, get so uh, uh, wouldn't become pouty if somebody that we really really didn't like came to know f- faith in Christ we ought to rejoice right we rejoice every time anybody comes to faith even people who've treated us in an ugly way or have been uh, dishonorable toward us we need to always have that sense that we're excited and joyful about people coming to faith now Barnabas was so excited about what he saw it says, now, what, you remember what Barnabas' uh, nickname, his, what his nickname Barnabas uh, means? The son of encouragement, okay? So every time you read a passage about Barnabas, what's he doing? He's encouraging people. That's his nickname. And he encouraged them that all that, all that with purpose of heart, a sense of, in other words, a sense of steadfastness in their heart that they were going to stick to exactly what uh, uh, God had been doing in them. He says, encourage them all with the purpose of heart that they should continue with the Lord, for he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord as Barnabas was there and helping teach. Now, the next thing we read about is Barnabas is is so excited, what does he do? He travels from Antioch in Syria all the way down to Tarsus where Paul uh, where Saul had been there uh, working for almost 10 years and he gets Saul and he brings him back to Antioch why because he had already he had already known in his heart Barnabas knew in his heart that he and Saul were going to be called on a mission by God be used in a mighty way so he goes down and he gets Saul and they go back to Antioch and the next thing you know is this and when he found him he brought him to Antioch so it was that for a whole year assembled with the church and taught a great many people and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch that's not a mistake they're first called Christians in Antioch because these are the people that stepped out and they showed the entire world the power of God. And the entire world, can you imagine the influence that from that Roman town, third uh, largest in the empire, what an impact that was going to make in people coming in and out of that city, knowing what it was beforehand, and then seeing the influence of the Antioch church. And then... We'll read on, and it talks about after, uh, after a, a time period, we get to chapter 13, and the church that it was at Antioch, uh, there, it names all the prophets and teachers and leaders and the growth of that church, and then they are impressed by the Holy Spirit to do one thing, to send Saul and Barnabas out on a mission, to lay their hands on them, pray on them, and send them out. Now, I want you to know one of the greatest things churches ever do is when they are unselfish and they recognize God has raised up leaders in them and the next thing that the Spirit tells you to do is you pray over them, you equip them, you give them the resources and you send them out. Churches become great, I believe, in the eyes of the Lord when we start multiplying ourselves in sending folks out to be on mission for him. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I, I've told you before, I'm selfish as the day is long, and my mother is here to testify to that. She could tell you all about that. But when it comes to as God's church grows and multiplies and leaders start 
uh, uh, rising up in the church. We need to take the model and the direction of the Antioch church and put it in practice. We ought to recognize when God's spirit tells us to send people out, we send people out. I had a friend who was a church planner, and we worked together uh, doing some church planning and teaching and things for our state convention here in Georgia. And Butch would tell the story of the church that God helped him uh, and his wife and a group of people plant in Loganville, Georgia. And it grew and it grew and it grew. And it grew to a point that God was impressing them that they needed to start new work. And they needed to plant new churches. And so his brother was one of those people in the church and he was going to, they were going to uh, pray over him. And what they did is they prayed over him, his family, other leaders. And I forget, he told me, uh, I think he told me uh, maybe 50 or 60 people from their church went out to start a new church, okay? Now, the problem, he said, they were 50 of the best tithers in the congregation. You know, they were 50 of the most dedicated leaders and workers in the congregation. And, they, and we sent them out, and he said, he said, boy, I really struggle with that. But you know what he told me? He said, in no time at all, all of those leaders and all those people had been replaced as the church there in Loganville continued to grow. You see, that's what God does. He never splits us out on purpose anyway. He never splits us out and says, uh, I'm going to make you weaker on this end. He's always going to supply more than who you need and what you need. And so when we see the Antioch church, what a great example and blessing for us to see who we need to be as God's people, that we need to be those people who recognize uh, God takes us, he uses us, and he wants and desires to see us not only grow, but we're not here to establish our own kingdom, are we? We're, we're not here to build the campus. We're here to build the kingdom. And the kingdom means it, we expand, we grow, we multiply, and we have mission points in other places, not just in one place. So God's given us so many opportunities, and we live in a, a really unique and wonderful community where we can see God is already at work, and he has so many opportunities for us in the future. Some of those mission points will be right here uh, in our area and in Georgia. Some of them, as I've been talking to uh, different leaders this week, some of them are going to be uh, in mission points in other parts of the world. But God's going to give us opportunity to do missions everywhere, just like the church at Antioch was going to have that opportunity. You realize how deep an influence they're going to have when uh, Saul and Barnabas are sent out and they go all over the known world building and establishing churches, and then they come back around, and in a, uh, a short amount of time, uh, the team multiplies to two church planting teams, and they're going back and doing the same thing. It's amazing how God works in the whole process. Let me just leave you a few thoughts to think about tonight from this scripture. What's the story of Antioch? First thing, they proclaimed without hesitation the good news of Jesus. They weren't afraid to teach and preach what was real, what God had instilled within them, and what he had told them to do. We need to recognize the hand of the Lord was upon them because they were willing in their spirit to do what God had commanded them to do. It's all about obedience, and God has commissioned all of us to proclaim that good news by the way we live in the world and by the words we say and by the actions that we take. So God's given us an opportunity. The story of Antioch starts with the fact that without hesitation, they were unafraid to go into the world, even in a pa very pagan and, and Roman world filled with Roman false gods. They were willing to go out and share and proclaim who God had called them to be. And because they were, not just Jews came to know Christ, but the whole Gentile world would come to know Jesus. So, so that's what the, the people at Antioch began to do. They were unafraid of the world's consequences. They cared for all people and not just one group here or one group there. They were a church centered on the gospel. And there was, they were a church that used all their resources to do it. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you're a church, and not any church, not just Sandy Valley, but any church, but if you, uh, you know, build this, build your own little kingdom and build your own, uh, you know, financial uh, uh, nest egg or whatever you do, and you never use that for ministry, what do you think Jesus is going to say when he comes back and looks us straight in the eye and say, why is there, uh, you know, uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars in this account and this account and this account? Are you afraid it was going to rain? Yeah, and we say, yeah, we, that because we're human beings, that's what we do. But God has called us all to do what? To use every resource and all that we have. We need to be smart about it. We need to make right decisions. We need to always have a, have a sense. We're going to be good stewards of everything that God gives us. But we need to recognize one big thing. God has called us to do ministry. He's not called us to uh, build our own kingdom. So we look at, without hesitation, the good news was shared in all kinds of ways. Second thing, we need to celebrate the grace of God, just like Barnabas did. Barnabas was celebrating God's grace. Why? Because God was at work among the people. We ought to celebrate when God's at work among people, right? We ought to celebrate it all the time. And they were faithful. Barnabas was faithful, and the church was faithful to celebrate it. We need to embrace the work of the Holy Spirit. When we embrace a, a true spirit from the Lord, then we're encouragers for each other, and we're never sidetracked from our purpose. What did uh, Barnabas tell them to do? He said uh, he encouraged them all that with purpose of heart, with a sense of being steadfast, a, res a firm resolve in their heart and their spirit. Don't turn to the left or the right, stay on track with the gospel of Christ, make that the center of everything. You know, it don't matter what color the carpet is. It doesn't matter what color the chairs are. It doesn't matter uh, where you meet. It, what matters is uh, are you sharing the good news of Jesus? And are you sharing it abundantly and with love and with grace and with power? And so he said, embrace the spirit. Embrace what God's doing. The fourth thing is keep your steadfast purpose. Never, uh, never, ever uh, turn away from what you're called to do or be and the last thing is to recognize the results what were the results great numbers of people came to church great numbers of people were in Sunday school great numbers of people gave great tithes and offerings no great numbers of people were added to the Lord meaning the church didn't just grow in numbers, it grew in power. Because as disciples uh, were multiplied, then that gave the opportunity for more disciples to be multiplied. That's one of the things that we forget. You know, we looked at that silly little video about uh, is our faith still in kindergarten? And what do you learn in kindergarten? You learn some colors, you learn some letters, you learn... Uh, to count some and to add some these days. But you don't learn about multiplying, do you? You have to get into the later grades to learn about multiplication tables and how to multiply. One of the, one of the tragic things, I think, in the church in America is we've forgotten how to multiply. We're really good at adding. And sometimes we're really good at subtracting, too. But we're not good at multiplying. You multiply the work and you multiply faith when you realize that disciples make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. So it, it doesn't stop. We don't, we don't uh, you know, Brother Antoine doesn't become uh, a believer and then say, boy, I like being a believer. I'm not going to share it with anybody else. No, it's Brother Antoine or anybody else in the uh, church family is going to do what? You're going to share your faith with somebody else, and they're going to share their faith with somebody else, and it's a multiplication process. The church at Antioch had the right idea. They had the right idea, and the results were what we read about a few moments ago. They had already added uh, numbers to the church, but it, it talks about uh, how a great many people 
uh, came, became a part of the ministry, and then they were called Christians in Antioch, and they used that not as a, a, a term to worry about, but something to be proud of. Because what does the word Christian mean? A little Christ. So think about that. When you're walking through your daily life and you call yourself a Christian, then all of us are supposed to be little Christ, meaning that we are striving to live more and more and more like Jesus every day. That's what that big old long uh, theological word sanctification means that you read about, especially in Paul's writings. We become sanctified or more and more set apart by God as we become more and more and more like Jesus. Now, our goal at Sandy Valley, and I believe at any church uh, that we're ever part of, is to listen to the Holy Spirit of God. As he gives us resources, we pray about how those resources ought to be used. We, when he identifies ministries, we pray over, does God want us to be in this ministry or this ministry? And we allow the Lord to use who we are as, as his people, use what we give and what we do. And one of the great things about this church family is this church gives so wonderfully to missions and missions and endeavors and uh, through our cooperative program and through the special mission gifts and to support people in the community in every way. And it's just outstanding. The, what, what would Barnabas say? Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Keep being faithful. Keep using everything that you got to share the gospel because that is the main thing. We, uh, in the church world and in our world here in America, I think, we get off the track many times by majoring on things that don't really matter. You've heard that term before, keep the main thing the main thing main thing is the gospel of Christ, and we need to keep that the main thing every day. Amen? Father, thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you for the powerful way you used the church at Antioch to help evangelize the world, how they were unafraid to use everything they had, unafraid of the government, unafraid of their uh, circumstance in the city, unafraid of everything that they or that, that, that could have held them back, and they stood up in faith and believed. And Lord, I thank you that you give us an opportunity to live uh, in that model too, and that we would be faithful to identify all the ways that you want us to serve and all the ministries you want us to be plugged into and all the ways that we can reach families in our community. Lord, sometimes... It's inconvenient. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it takes lots and lots of work. And it takes unselfishness. And it takes our uh, ability to put you first. Help us, God. Be like Barnabas. And encourage each other and spur one another on to be steadfast and to strive to hold on to the main thing, the gospel of Christ to share it every day in every way that we can, and to know that our time to do it is limited. So as the time is limited for us to do it, help us do it with all of our heart and with everything that we've got within us. Lord, we admit the fact we're not only unworthy people, but Lord, sometimes we're lazy people. We, we get that way and we allow our selfish attitudes to get in the way of everything else. But I thank you that we have so many folks here at Sandy Valley who have the desire to see other people come to know Christ and other people come to a real sense of, of mature faith. So help us be the disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've given, and thank you for our uh, ability and the joy we have to agree together to pray. So in just the next little while, as Brother Phil comes to share the needs of the congregation with us, help us be faithful to recognize those needs, pray over those, and allow those needs to be met in your power and your spirit.
We love you, Lord, and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brother Phil.